When Sega released the Master System in the US, I remember the TV commercials proclaiming its arrival. I was already well aware of the NES at this point, but the prospect of Sega arcade games at home was a real draw for me. Games like Choplifter, Fantasy Zone, and Hang On were prominently featured, stuff that looked and ran better than anything on its competitors at the time. I wasn't privy to new hardware at this point in my life, but I was lucky enough to know someone who got the Master System shortly after launch with a bunch of its games. In this episode, we will be going over many of the software titles the Master System got during its initial 1986 showing, and I share some of my memories and opinions of them. I hope you guys enjoy early Sega Master System games. When the system came out, everyone had access to the built-in game Snail Maze. If you fired her up without a cartridge or card in it, you would get the system BIOS telling you to insert a game. If you press up and both buttons, you unlocked Snail Maze, a super simple game of getting from point A to point B before the timer runs out. It wasn't anything special, but it was cool that Sega built a game right into the system. One of the early killer apps on the Master System was Choplifter, a game with a unique history. It was first a product for the Apple II computer, which Sega secured the rights to to make an arcade version. Sega then ported the arcade version to the SG-1000, which was essentially the first iteration of the Master System itself. Sega then ported Choplifter again here, resulting in the best home version of the game by quite a bit. The premise is simple fly around the battlefield, rescue hostages, and don't get shot down. She's a good one and holds up well today. As a fan of the arcade version of Fantasy Zone, you can imagine my utter delight on how the Master System version turned out. Coming in at only one megabit, it still manages to capture the look and feel of its source quite well. It has most of the content from the arcade and is an essential part of the Sega experience. The first Sega card game I ever saw was Ghost House, a game loosely based on Sega's arcade game Monster Bash. You basically have to run around, attack or avoid the bad guys, and defeat the Draculas that are slumbering in their coffins. This game is a mere 32 kilobytes, so I'm shocked it looks as good as it does, and the simple play mechanics make it an easy to pick up and play game, yet challenging action title. This had a cartridge release in a few other territories to boot. Unlike everywhere else in the world, Hang On never saw a dedicated release in the US. Instead, it was coupled together with the light phaser title Safari Hunt. I really like this version of Hang On, but oh man is it hard as hell. It was unforgiving if you touched another rider or the sides of the tracks, resulting in an instant fiery death. I really dug the smoothness though, and once you get used to it, it's a great ride to take. It was also available on Sega Card in Japan and Europe. I'd like to apologize to the fans of My Hero, because I'm about to thrash this game. For 30 plus years I've had to watch my girlfriend get kidnapped and then proceed to have my ass whooped time and time again. One hit man, and it's over. This dude is absolutely worthless. 
unable to string together rapid hits, resulting in untold deaths. This shouldn't be called my hero, it should be called asses whooped, because that's all I ever accomplished in this infuriating game. It was released on both a Sega card and cartridge, depending on your region. Teddy Boy was another Sega card game in the US, but this time a pretty good one. It's kind of a run and gun with puzzle elements, with some decent music and responsive gameplay. Sega card games were tiny in size and cheaper than cartridges, so when a good one came along, you tended to take notice. It's another one with a cart version available in other regions. I won't lie to you here, I didn't know what the heck was going on in F-16 Fighting Falcon back then, and I still don't today. I assume the white lines are supposed to be the surface, and the little globs of color the planes you try and shoot down. It was on a Sega card in most regions, and Europe even saw a cartridge version of it. It's a bad game no matter which format you choose. Transbot was a game I really wanted to love. I liked shoot 'em ups in general, and the transforming theme was right up my alley. Unfortunately, the randomized power-up mechanic was awful, and the repetitive waves of enemies grew really tiresome. It was one of Sega's first Sega card games, but is also available on cartridge in Europe and Brazil, the latter called Nuclear Creature. World Grand Prix was a fantastic racing game built on the same engine as Hang On. It still has that unforgiving difficulty, but the addition of creating your own tracks was really cool. I enjoyed this one quite a bit, and recommend you try it if you have a Master System collection looking for a good racer. Every now and again I run up on a game that just crushes me no matter how hard I try. Action Fighter here was one such game. This was Sega's take on the Spy Hunter style game, and it's just as brutally difficult. It has cool power-ups you can get, going from a car combat game to a full-fledged shoot-'em-up. I enjoyed it for what it is, but I've been killed in this game countless times. Every Sega Master System fan knows Black Belt. It was an incredibly unique game to be so early in the life of the system. It features two distinct game engines, a side-scrolling action fest that has you battling multiple enemies at a time, as well as a one-on-one -on -one fighting engine similar to a Street Fighter experience. It was based on Hokuto no Ken, or what was the Japanese version of Fist of the North Star. When Sega launched the system, they needed a mascot-style platformer to compete with Mario, and thus we received Alex Kidd in Miracle World. There are some out there that love this game, its variety, and its visual and audio presentation. It's certainly a unique take on things, particularly when it comes to its many vehicles and horizontal and vertically scrolling stage design.
Astro Warrior was a simple shoot 'em up, but I enjoyed it quite a bit. It was challenging and I appreciated the power ups and large boss fights. It's not going to blow you away in any one category, but it can still be a fun game for a few playthroughs. I still remember the utter disappointment in Great Ice Hockey. My friend gets the title and we can't play it worth a damn. I mean, nothing controls right at all. And then we realize the game has to have the Sega Sports Pad, a trackball-like controller to play it properly. Want to play multiplayer? You have to have two of the things. The game itself wasn't terrible, but it did have a weird multi-sectional play field that needed to scroll during play that was difficult to get used to. I always have to laugh whenever Nintendo kitties wax nostalgic and talk about how hard games like Mega Man and Ninja Gaiden were for the NES. Those games were difficult, but you could play a good ways into them before they became so. The Sega Master System says hello with the Ninja, a game that takes a giant shit on you from the moment you start moving the character around. It's based on Sega's arcade game Ninja Princess an overhead vertically scrolling running gun that pits you against a horde of ninja bad guys. This one is damn tough, and only repeated plays to recognize the enemy patterns will give you any chance at all. As a wrestling fan in my youth, I was immediately drawn to pro wrestling for the Master System. I loved its characters and easy to get into mechanics. The moves list is simple, but includes some great ones such as a pile driver and neck breaker. It gets repetitive after a while, but still a great playing game, especially in its two player mode. I was instantly drawn to Rambo First Blood Part 2 as well. I loved the movie as a kid, and being able to tear up the screen as the stallion was incredibly satisfying. The two player mode was icing on the cake, giving you two Rambo characters to run roughshod. This actually is known under a different name depending on the region. In Japan it was known as Ashura, and in Europe it was called Secret Command. Unlike most of the Sega Sports lineup, Super Tennis didn't take on the prefix Great in the US despite being called Great Tennis in Japan. This Sega Card Sports entry is one of the most infuriating titles available on the system in its first year. The gameplay is incredibly hard to come to terms with, and just hitting the ball reliably is a big chore. Like most Sega Card entries, it was also released on a cartridge in a few European territories. That first year of the Master System in the US was actually loaded with some strong titles. Stuff like the Ninja, Black Belt, Pro Wrestling, and Rambo 2 were all really fun, strong playing entries into the new era of gaming. I think Sega's biggest mistake here was the sheer amount of Sega card games it released in the beginning. 
I understand looking at it from a value standpoint, but many potential buyers would see these simple looking games and think that's all the system was capable of. Many of Sega's big arcade releases also didn't see a release on the hardware until the following years. Outrun, Space Harrier, Afterburner, Thunderblade, and Shinobi didn't see ports until 1987 and 1988, leaving the system to be represented against the Nintendo juggernaut with only these titles in the early days of their retail conflict. Despite how that ended up, I always respected the Master System for giving us a completely different experience than what Nintendo was doing. The vast majority of its library wasn't available on anything else for years, and the visual strength of its games were well above its competition. I'm Sigalord X, thank you guys for watching, and I will catch you next time.